a very good morning students and uh, academic students who have, fo who have followed and joined us on this uh, broadcast uh, i welcome you all on this sunday morning uh, to the penultimate day of this online lecture series for degree students being organized by the department of english kkm college jammu and uh, english literature briefs we will have the last lecture of this series tomorrow at uh, 11 uh, and for today uh, we have uh, an independent academician and i take deep privilege in uh, announcing her and introducing to you all uh, because the the topic of her lecture that she is supposed to deliver today is definitely of both interest and relevance as far as far as degree students are concerned today we will have with us uh, dr lisa sinha dr lisa sinha after pursuing masters in english and comparative literature from pondicherry university has received her phd from central university of bilaspur her areas of interest include indian writings in english post colonial studies post modern st theories cultural studies modern and post modern theater she has attended workshops and conferences both national and international including the prestigious capee conference hosted by university of britain united kingdom she has also published her papers in international journals in addition to contributing chapters in edited volumes we look forward to have a very productive lecture uh, and her, the topic of her lecture today will be subjective lamb meets his past a select study of charles lamb's essays definitely a topic of vital interest and relevance in re romantic english literature so no, i'll uh, ask ma'am to now take over this platform and uh, present her lecture dr lisa sena thank you so much pranjit for such introduction uh, first of all i would like to be very thankful to kkm college jammu mugar university for giving me this platform and also dr anindya sundar polle for inviting me to this lecture along with his principal uh, sir dr prasad and also i would like to thank the youtube channel uh, in literature briefs which is really very uh, it is i would say it's a very great initiative that in this pandemic they have actually come with the thought that um, having such uh, topics which are very pertinent to the pertinent to the degree college students will really be helpful in the long run especially when the exams are supposed to come this coming september so and i also thank you pranjit uh, for introducing me and in today's lecture i will um, try to be as lucid as possible so so that it will be you know it will be uh, the peer students can easily understand especially the beginners so um, now without wasting any more time i would like to uh, share my ppt is it visible yeah okay shall i start yeah go ahead okay. so today i'll be talking on uh, the topic subjective lamb means his past a select study of charles lamb's essays so in this lecture my uh, key discussion will pertain mainly to the introduction a uh, brief survey of charles lamb subjectivity in charles lamb embodiment of past discussion of his selected essays and the concluding remarks 
So when we talk about essay, we always find that you can say that if we uh, quote Stephen Jean, that it has always been considered as the essay, which would always to be an inferior genre. But if we towards the uh, towards the movement towards uh, uh, end of uh, 16th century, we have this French essayist Montaigne, who actually brought. Uh, the um, essay to the mainstream genre. So his essays were particularly those of casual anecdotes and it was combined with his autobiographical element and also there were intellectual insight. By the time of the end of 17th century, the essay gradually took a uh, more coherent structure, which I mean to say that there was linking of phrases and words actually led to the structural unity of the uh, structural unity, which obviously gave essay a beginning, a body and conclusion. So you see that even though Samuel Johnson in his dictionary has defined essay as a loose sally of the mind, an irregular indigested piece, not a regular and orderly composition. But if you consider the essays towards uh, the end of 18th century, it is no doubt that uh, the uh, essayist actually ex has expressed their feelings, their emotions, and also they're very creative in uh, forwarding their opinions. But gradually, it, the essays actually uh, molded itself. It, you can say it uh, took a turn from 16th century to 17th century and gradually to 18th century. So there were essays like uh, Francis Bacon uh, or say uh, Steele Addison, Sir Thomas Browning, Hasley, Thomas De Quincey and even Charles Lamb. Now when we come to the 18th uh, towards the end of 18th century and we are entering to the Romantic age, we find essayist, especially Charles Lamb, who took essay into a different uh, level. So Charles Lamb, I'll directly move on to my topic without digressing to what uh, essay, uh, giving the uh, detailed background of essay. Uh, I will particularly speak on Charles Lamb, especially the uniqueness of Charles Lamb, which actually made him different both from uh, the essays of Bacon. Now, why am I talking about Bacon, Francis Bacon? See, Francis Bacon is called as the father of English essays. So, you see, he, Charles Lamb differed from Bacon in the way that Bacon's essays were considerably subjective. It, it had impersonal element and it was mainly subject focused. But Charles Lamb's essays were more subjective, was more personal. And again, he also differed from Montaigne. I've already said that this French essayist Montaigne was actually uh, so, uh, had uh, this casual anecdote infused with his autobiographical element and, and there was some uh, personal element in his essays. But still, Charles had differed from Montaigne and Lamb's tone was more confidential and perhaps more confessional. So his essays, Montaigne was like he took the self pride in declaring that he is the subject of his essays. It is his self portrait in the essays. Unlike Lamb, Lamb on the other hand tried to hide himself behind the use of his pseudonym, which we all know that, uh, or for the beginners, I will say that he used the pseudonym, or you can say pen name, as Elia. So he tried to go behind the curtain, use a different name and yet bring out his personal elements. Now, if we look at his works, say that he has written, uh, his career started uh, with uh, the tales of Rosamund Gray. And then till almost uh, 1808, his works like Tales from Shakespeare, Specimens of English Dramatics, The Old Familiar Faces has already established him as a famed writer. But it was only through his essays of Ilya and uh, last essays of Ilya, he actually, you can say that those were his masterpieces, which till date has 
uh, has established him as a prominent literary figure in the field of essays. So his essays are reflection of uh, witty, humorous, and even conversational. The characters which he has fused with his incidents and events and the activities of his life. So if you uh, look uh, at the features of his essays, there are certain central tenets of his essays. Like you will see that uh, even though he has uh, like uh, he has uh, tried to show the self revelation and there was where he actually revealed his himself. He is the subject of the essay. He has this uh, combination of humor and pathos where you have this ridiculous attitude towards the events. He, he will laugh at it. On the other side, you will see that behind that laugh, laughter, there is a sense of mirth. There is a sense of pity at the events and the persons or even the places which he is describing. He is a bit of conversational. The manner he writes his essays, you will it appears as if he's talking to us. He's talking to the readers as if he's having a daily chit chat. Then again, his other feature is there is a blend of fancy and imagination. And obviously, it is very obvious factor in almost all his works, especially his essays, where you see that even though he has tried to talk about the facts, he's talking about people, places from his past, still. He encompasses them within the show of fancy and imagination. And obviously, when you um, uh, talk about, he is obviously talking about the diverse topics which are associated with his past, be it uh, going on a, a buffet or going to an orchestra or talking about the chimney sweepers, talking about his favorite people. He has uh, all diverse topics are all associated somehow with his past. So you see, when uh, this, uh, th this obviously creates a feeling of commonality. I mean to say that when you're talking about your daily life, when, for example, you get up, for example, you have this habit of going early morning and going, uh, going to see the sunrise at the peak of hill, then you will see like you, there are people who are interested in seeing that sunrise. So same when Lamp speaks of his past, he speaks in such a way which obviously encode to the daily activities. You will find that there is some bonding. He is establishing a kind of bonding uh, between the author and the reader. And above all, if you read his essays, you will find that uh, I think uh, the um, lamp, his very uh, son in lamp, you see, reveals what he is. Like lamp, he is also he was also very meek. Uh, he was also very weak. He was also gentle. So you see that um, uh, he, uh, his essays are what he is. His essays are what his persona is. So. I, my topic is that subjectivity in his essays, right? So you'll see that how the subjectivity is brought for in his essays. So earlier I have mentioned Francis Bacon, who is obviously the father of the English essays, that his essays are, you can say, a kind of uh, subjective essays where you see that Bacon, sorry, objective essays where you can see he is not attached to the reader who is not at all trying to establish a bond with the reader. Instead, he is trying to diverge on topics. He is trying to diverge talks which are very focused on uh, certain specific topics which are in a way informative to the readers, which are in a way giving the readers a kind of new perception. But if you compare this with Lamp, it is totally different. Uh, for example, if you see that uh, in Bacon's of studies, you will feel that the intention is just to create awareness about things which the reader has taken for granted and in a way he's trying to give a new ways of perception. And now opposed to this objectivity, uh, opposed to this objectivity, we have this concept of subjectivity. So William Cohen has written that 
he gives subjectivity which gives voice to ideas about the correspondence between an interior self and outer form where interiority itself is taken as a subject of cultural studies it is often treated as merely a synonym of subjectivity so uh, you see that um, just hold on i'm sorry I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Yeah, so uh, I'm really sorry for the technical issue. I'm not familiar with this uh, this uh, platform, so I'm extremely sorry. Okay, so coming to this um, subjectivity, you see that Lamb's essays are a reflection of this concept of subjectivity. So here you will find that it is. His inner self, which is trying to meet, which is trying to come to uh, and meet the outer form. So you see that uh, in a way. So here I've tried to bring out uh, the fact that how uh, this cons this lamps essays are indeed fit into the shoes of subjectivity because a closer look will. Definitely prove the point because you see there are certain fixes and features of his essays which obviously will um, uh, re allow the reader to know that how subjective his essays are. The first point which I have taken is pseudonym. So I'll just quote that pseudonym is uh, while uh, you see Lam has used his name as Ilya. We all know it is his pen name. So, why he has used this? So, you can see it contains his essays, has all the experience of Lamb right from his school, colleges, peoples, places he visited, he loved, he interacted. So, in a way, he was looking something that uh, which will be personal and since they are in abundant, since uh, they are, have the abundant material of his personal life so he wanted to use a kind of pen name which will keep him attached yet detached i mean to say that on screen he will be like establishing a bond with the readers but that will be his pen name at the same time he will be the one who will be detached from his pen name and bringing up the fact that it was his inner self. So in a way, he's trying to bring out his inner self through Elia. So, and also by using the pen name, he might be like, uh, it, it, since it is very extremely personal to public, yet he's right to intend to stand detached and thus uh, save himself from the embarrassment by staying, stepping aside. So this uh, again brings to his next point that is, I, me, you, mine. If you just look at his uh, essays, you will find there is wrapped with incidents of this I, me, you, mine. So it makes his essays all the more subjective, all the more personal. So this also uh, use of this first person makes him easy go with his speculations, his opinions, and also is a kind of a self-revelation to the reader so when you're doing this kind of self-revelation where, where you're trying to be intimately you're trying to establish a intimate bond with the readers in a way you're trying to uh, bring the uh, reader into your confidence to whom you can divulge your intricate and the minute the deep uh, secrets of your life so again, in the next, I've also tried to bring this uh, subjectivity, maybe because uh, this age factor. By age factor, I mean that Charles Lamb belonged to the age of romanticism. It, he belonged to the uh, romantic age. So the first and foremost tenet of romantic age is um, intimacy, is confidentiality, is revealing of oneself. So the writers uh, of the age 
actually try to uh, talk more about themselves to the readers than to a close friend, I would say. So Lamb also was flowing with the tide. He was also like, uh, like his romantic age brothers, he also tried to bring the intimate and confidential uh, points in his writing. So, uh, in a way, uh, this obviously tries, uh, um, this obviously enables him to build an empathetic bond uh, with him, uh, between himself and all the uh, place, person, events, occasions, memories, all uh, he has experienced earlier. So, you can see that there is, uh, as a result, uh, he, uh, Lamb keeps moving through familiar objects, events, and divulge um, a substantial account of his large part of life. Fourth point, when you talk of subjective, obviously you will find you're bringing out something personal. And what more personal can be when you talk about your own past? So Charles Lamb, in fact, uh, laid down his entire past right in front of us be it his opinions, be it his tastes, dislikes, be it activities or even his characters. He, in a way, he has delineated his own states and conditions, which obviously revolve around his uh, uh, acquaintance with the personal uh, likes or dislikes, preferences or aversions, taste, temperament, and nature and disposition his meditation and reflection, even his reaction to person, events, things, and so on. So as a result, because of his such uh, intimate divergence, we come to know that he was born at Inner Temple, he was schooled at Christ Hospital, he worked at um, uh, Indian East India House, uh, he was a lover uh, who quoted for seven years but yet refused. Uh, then he was a bachelor for life. He had, a, even though he was very shy and weak, and uh, still he had uh, one common friend, like uh, that was Coleridge, who kept um, circling, uh, circulating in all his essays. Then he also had a very favorite aunt. He had obviously his sister Mary was one of the. Um, I would say he, uh, she featured the core of his essays. Then also, uh, he had, we come to know about his uh, grandmother, about his father, about his brother. So you see, through, this is the reason why his essays appear to be autobiographical. Uh, it, uh, it is the subjective note which is predominant in all his readers. So as we uh, move, uh, so my next uh, segment is embodiment of past. So I have said that he was subjective in his essays. Now what I'm trying to do is uh, his essays, how his essays are embodiment of past, how his essays are all his recollections, all his reminiscences, all his uh, past affairs, actions, uh, activities, people come to fore in his essays. So in a letter to Wordsworth, uh, back in January 30, 1809, he has actually tried to recall people he knew as a boy, uh, the places he loved, the places he visited, and the books, uh, be it classic and old, all that he fancied, imagined, and even was, uh, until date they were within his memory. So when he says that the rooms where I was born, the furniture which has been before my eyes all my life, a bookcase which has followed me about like a faithful dog, only exerting in a knowledge. Wherever I moved old chairs, old tables, streets, quacks, where I have sent myself, my old school, these are my mistresses. So you see, look at the lines very carefully. Then you show that how Lamb was very much attached to his past, to his bygone days so much that he can, even the uh, events which has happened uh, 20 to 30 years ago is still afresh in his mind. Now, when, throughout, uh, till this time I have been talking about past. So 
what do you mean by past so it's not that past is not that lamp is talking about the past of history or any race or any country here what he says it is his personal history which incorporates the recollections the places the people the events he has encountered now you see as i've already discussed that uh, the essays are very much personal and very much subjective but actually they don't dig deep into the readers they what i try to mean that he is not theorizing his past in a way just he is a random um, it's like a, a reading out uh, a kind of story to a ch to children so uh, he uh, we just uh, come to know that it is just his uh, flashes of self revelation which obviously uh, mingles with his fancy and imagination with his humor with his pa uh, pathos so you see it is you can see there is artistic detachment even for his painful memories and by uh, when he uses when i say artistic detachment for his painful memories he obviously uh, he does uh, skillfully through his uh, use of fancy and imagination and even uh, his ridiculous uh, use of phrases and events uh, words in his essays so again here i this brings at this juncture of two key points now the two key points are that what should what made him to be personal in his essays uh, and the second is how this personal is infused in his essays so under this uh, why personal i have tried to bring three points first and foremost point i would say that uh, the line obviously will tell you that why he has been personal uh, hand the age i will write for antiquity you see lamp was in the uh, used to live in the city of london and he was not actually attached to the modern things that happened in london rather he preferred to isolate from those modern things prefer to st uh, stay away from the modern things and instead he mainly focused on all those antiquarian and the old fashioned people and objects and uh, the environment around him next is that his fancy imagination is combined with memories now you see he was having a very uh, mundane working life i need to say that while working in east india house he was uh, going through all those cold accounts of the leisure day and night and repeated it on repeated days every day the same routine so he had not and also he was a bachelor so he had nothing to do no uh, just work and work so this obviously when you have uh, when you completely i would i won't say that lamb was totally engrossed in his work i would say that he was not engrossed you can say he was he has taken a job to keep himself busy and to earn for himself so obviously so if you don't love a job then i don't think you will enjoy it i think something that happened with lamb also so that as a result which made his working life a boring a lifeless so as a result he wanted to sneak away from his mundane life so this gave him ample amount of uh, uh, reminiscing his past recollecting his past obviously when you recollect your past you will have all kinds of fancy and imagination running down through those memories through those memories as such in the, his essays uh, um, uh, uh, not only brings out his personal uh, statement but also they are blended in the form of his own fancy and imagination the third important point i would say uh, that is the 1796 incident so you see that he had a very beloved sister so with whom he was uh, who was his constant companion who was like the motherly care which he found through her so his sister mary was uh, since um, was someone that who was attached to his everyday 
uh, emotion. I would use the word everyday emotion. So, but unfortunately, his sister, as it drugs down in the family, it seems that his sister too sank down to insanity and after and also had repeated attack of insanity. And then it was that later it was her sister who killed their mother. So this is something that has deeply affected Lam. So what you do when you are uh, very deep, when you're sad, when you are hurt, what do you do? Whether in, if we consider our today's modern world, what do we do? We would uh, like to watch uh, some movie or you can say you just uh, read some story or you can say uh, you can uh, you step down and and the best you can do is what you will do. I'm definitely sure you just recollect, you'll try to recollect your happier moments which you have already passed. So this is what Lamb did. His way of relieving his, his uh, escaping from his prison became, uh, um, uh, he sought refuge in his past. So in order to escape from the tragedy of prison, he preferred to be uh, lingering in past. And when you linger in past, you try to uh, be very personal. And especially, and this will obviously vent out when you write them down. And when you write them down, it will be like, it will be like as if you're speaking to someone. So when you're trying to vent out your anger, vent out or say your emotions, your sorrow to someone else, it obviously lightened up, right? So, but in case of Lamb, Lamb was, let me tell you, was very shy in nature. So, he had friends, but he talking about his personal details was something that he would not do. So I would say, I think that uh, I assume that uh, this is the uh, this is the reason why he started writing the essays. Uh, he started writing, which will obviously uh, encompass his own opinions. He will uh, he will try to uh, bring out his own persona. Uh, so that they will also try to relieve him from his prison. So he, he will indeed, he tried to bring out all, because of this uh, sorrowful uh, prison, he tried to get back to his, to his happier past, which obviously was not happy always. And then through his essays, he tried to reveal his nervous temperament, his shy melancholic air, his want of skill, uh, then dread of novelty, then his short stature, then his weakness for wine and tobacco, then his love for cheer, and all this actually became his revelation of the inner life to his outer life. So Lamb's retrospection actually assumed him the role of both the narrator and commentator in his essays. So so these are the three points which makes him very personal in essays. Now the point is that how he indulged those personal, uh, how his personal attributes uh, makes his way into the uh, essays. Now before moving, I'll just like to quote De Quincey that he said the character in a capital degree molds oftentimes the life, but the life always, uh, but the life always in a subordinate degree molds the character. And the character being in this case of Lamb so much of a key to the writings, it becomes important that the writer should be traced, however briefly, as a key to the character. So, with these words, we are, this is, uh, we can say that this truly applicable to Lamb case. So, the effect of Lamb's environment is very crucial in framing Lamb's inner self. And instead of moving forward, he moved backward. He withdrew from his present and instead resided himself within the core of his past. So earlier we have discussed that how uh, subjective he is. So now while discussing subjective, I have also talked about his pseudonym area. So I have already said that why uh, area. Suppose uh, 
area you can say it's someone to detach himself uh, yet remain uh, establish a bond with the readers uh, so um, here again i'll bring his pseudonym Elia. Uh, so uh, before i uh, bring in i just uh, i would like you to note that while he's before he started his first essay that south sea house he mentioned his friend john teller that his uh, he wanted to write all about his past all about his belief all about his opinions which are a very substantial amount and they are in huge bulk so it would be very easier if i have a pseudonym so he's so this how his uh, he wanted to have a pen name for himself so he actually through his pseudonym he brought his his persona into the aces so by that time uh, lamp was already um, uh, has started suffering uh, post uh, 1796 tragedy of his uh, mother and his sister he has already moved into his second nature of lamp where he has already formed a world of his own past filled with his own imagination and fancy so when i talk about his uh, fancy and imagination you will find that if you read his essays you will find that his entire essays are uh, the uh, serve the dual purpose of both uh, fact and fiction on one side you will have his uh, imagination reaching out the sky and again uh, you at the same time you will again see that he comes back to the ground reality of the fact that he uh, has to face so if you just look at uh, his uh, name uh, pen name Ilya you will see it's an anagram a line so uh, even though he says that, even though he brings out his own personal details, yet he is trying to be discreet. He is trying to be discreet from his readers as Lamb himself. So, he, for him, whatever he writes his uh, essays, it's a kind of fictionalization. So, even though when he talks uh, so it's very uh, for lamb it was like he kept on switching between past present present past and then past and present so uh, so i would say that it was only his uh, refuge towards uh, fancy and imagination that enabled him to uh, make this switch from uh, present to past and past to present so when he says that reader what if I have been playing with thee all this while? But adventure, the very names which I have summed up before thee are fantastic in substantial, like Henry Pimperton and old John Naps of Greeks. Be satisfied that something answering to them has had a being. Their importance is from the past. So you see that if one side he's daydreaming, he's fantasizing, but the on the next you will find the author is becoming very nostalgic about his early life in the past and he remembers his near and dear ones so his uh, aunt sarah lamb becomes his aunt hetty the place is blackswear becomes black smooth and then his brother john becomes his uh, uh, brother james elia his sister mary becomes um, cousin bridget and even um, his um, even the uh, character like mrs barney becomes mrs batten so what uh, so in the next point i've tried to show that how this he has been personal in the essays and this he has smoothly done through the blend of his blend of his humor and pathos <laughs> see his retrospection of past makes him both imaginative and at the same time transform transport him to the nostalgic past but again if you say that uh, if you talk about lamb's past 
you will see that lamb uh, even though we have happier memories of him but he also has a very sorrowful past he was a um, rejected lover he was a bachelor he lost his mother he lost his grandmother he lost his brother at very early stage his uh, only companion mary uh, went to insanity so all this conjured together all these aspects conjured together to make his memories from past painful and distressing but again lamp was very witty he was very cheerful in nature in fact uh, there are uh, in fact i would say that when uh, he was among his peers uh, when he was among uh, he was the one who was always at the jovial mood so this is also very pertinent in his essays even though he uh, pathos are in his essays even though he had painful um, past yet he uh, it is his ridiculous it is his if he has this tendency to lighten up and to brighten up by laughing at his own miseries so the manner that in uh, that they become the heart and mind of lamp and this combo of humor and pathos is actually uh, um, all revealed in broad delight in his essays so this always gives him to mock and jest uh, and also to reflection on his griefs thus the dreams the mockery the human forms all form the uh, uh, persona of elia so so as a result when he is doing so so his blend of humor and pathos his blend of fantasy and imagination his uh, bringing his recollections of uh, people places uh, events occasions are try to divulge every inch of his memories right from his childhood days to school days his love relations his dislike and likes and thus oh, we uh, he enable we readers to know that his childhood uh, was an inner temple which you can find in the essay the old bench of the inner temple that his school days can be um, diversed in recollections of christ hospital that even we come to know from his uh, about his profession uh, of being a clerk uh, from the south sea house and then uh, about his intimate friend in the christ hospital 5 and 30 years ago and also about his uh, very close relations like his brother john lamb sister mary aunt sarah sarah lamb grandmother phil his lover and simons all from uh, essays like my relations and dream children so here this lamb's essays are self reflective subjectivism which establishes a thorough record of his memories his emotions his embarrassment embarrassments and imagination so in this in the coming section i will try to show that how the narrative is a blend of self and others in a very realistic uh, condition and also a recollection of past from um, uh, from lamb's personal life so first of all i'll deal with the past of people so lamp was very sensitive in nature he was very amiable personality he was very uh, shy he was also melancholic he was also uh, very emotional and also very sensitive so whatever uh, whoever he made who uh, who uh, uh, all the persons he made and all the close relations he had for life he always had them very close to his heart he treasured the, them in his memories so uh, here i have taken a few essays so i will uh, which obviously uh, all his close relations are uh, presented in a very uh, tender and affectionate uh, way in his essays so first of all i bring uh, in the essay the south sea house so south sea house is the first essay where um, uh, he actually <coughs> sorry we started working he says that he worked there for eight whole months 
um, no, sorry, five months. So here you see that in this essay, we can observe the manner uh, he evokes the uh, atmosphere of the bygone bygone days. So, um, so you see that he, I would quote him, that such is the South Sea House, sea house. at least it was 40 years ago, when I knew it, a magnificent relic. And most important, when he says that his magnificent relic, you can say that he is also uh, trying to bring up those uh, colleagues who has um, had very uh, special place in his memories. So, in a way, he is trying to bring his colleagues in a very dual flashes of delightful wheat and humor. For example, he describes his colleague Hepworth as from his gravity, Newton might have deduced the laws of gravitation. So his colleagues are the uh, are in a way revealed as the odd eccentrics and humorous exaggeration which characterizes uh, in uh, Lamb's essays in a way that they are all uh, old fashioned, they were humorous, they were like odd fishes in Noah's Ark, as if they're uh, the they were two special. Uh, each particular people were treasured. Each of these eccentricities, each of their uh, special idiosyncrasies, were preserved in the essay. In the next, next uh, I have dealt with the essay, the Christ Hospital, five and thirty years ago. He says that I was a poor, friendless boy. The my parents, my parents and those who should care for me were far away and I felt myself alone among 600 playmates. The cruelty of separating a poor lad from his early homestead, the yearnings which I used to have it in those unfledged years. How in my dreams would my native town far in the west come back with its church and trees and faces? How I would wake weeping and in the anguish of my heart exclaimed upon sweet cane in Wildshire. So this essay, as you can see, that it has this charm of his autobiography. So this essay was written uh, in the name of Coleridge, as if Coleridge himself is talking about his own. Uh, Coleridge is the I here. But and uh, actually, uh, it is the vice versa. Here, lamp is the lamp's uh, experiences are divulged through college. So this is actually a gateway of the revelation of his pensive mood, his nervousness, his fear of initiation, his dislike for school uh, discipline. So the characters like Matthew Field, the teachers like Matthew Field, James Boyer, and uh, the mm, high school boys, <coughs> all had these deep touches in his essay. So even in this essay, one of the uh, most uh, uh, favorite person in Lamb's life, Aunt Haiti, is mentioned. Aunt Haiti. Uh, is mentioned with a very tender in an, an in a very affectionate manner. You can say Aunt Haiti is in reality the Shara Sara Lamb of uh, Sara Lamb, the aunt of uh, Jazz Lamb. So actually, in real life, Sara Lamb had a very uh, intimate relationship, very close relationship with his nephew. It, she was like a mother figure. So much so that uh, Sarah Lamb uh, has uh, been in his essay, in, uh, say more than uh, one time. So uh, because he keeps recalling the uh, loved nature of his aunt, who was actually uh, one who, uh, even in his school days while he was at the Christ Hospital, uh, served him with delicacies and also uh, cared for him. So even in my mind, in his essay, My Relation, uh, he quote that I had an aunt, a dear and good one. She was one when single blessed had served to the world. She often used to say that I was the only thing in it she, which she loved. And when she thought I was quitting it, she grieved over me with mother's tears. So even in this essay, in My Relations, you will find that he mentions his aunt with a very special kindness. 
so much so that when she died he uh, wrote a funeral poem um, uh, for uh, his favorite art as uh, the last re recollection of her thou to art dead very kind hard thou been to me in my childish days thou best good creature i have not forgot how thou didst love thy charles whom he was yet a pretty school boy farewell good art so you see that how his uh, how this person who are very close to him featured almost in all the essays and time to time he brought them so that he can uh, keep them alive as if he can keep them alive in his memories uh, same goes with his friend uh, colridge whose uh, memories uh, uh, serve as a dearest friend to lap and even he himself when he says that i was a poor friendless boy uh, my parents and those who should care for me were far away so when his parents were far away it was he found his love in college he found someone with whom he can confide in so college and lamb had let me tell you that college and lamb had a very steadfast friendship even so much so that uh, lamb considers him to be one uh, that uh, to whom he can confide so in this essay when he uh, writes uh in the name of colridge you can see that uh, when you talk something personal you should have someone confide in so uh, lamb sees in colridge that he is someone uh, through him uh, to whom he can divulge his intimate details next this is one essay which uh, is most often read uh, in our syllabus <laughs> that is the dream children are revered so this essay in a way brings on stage uh, the unfulfilled wish of lamb which he is supposed to have completed uh, in a dream which otherwise would have been incomplete in actual life so you see that i have already mentioned that uh, he brings in the fact and uh, fa uh, fact and fantasy uh, fact and fancy in his essays so this is the best example where you can find that his fancy and imagination uh, couples up with his own past so when he talks about the subtitle a uh, rivery so a rivery is something that which allows one to pleasantly get back to his own thoughts or daydreams and in case of lab he is actually dreaming about his children who is supposed to have been born by his lover uh, and simons uh, who is uh, alice l in the essay but unfortunately um and simons has left him in real life so in this essay you find his children alice and john who are also um uh, who are listening to the uh, to their father about uh, his uh, own uh, past so you see it is like framed uh, it is you can say uh, it is a framed narrative because you see that one he is talking about uh, the essay within the essay again lamp is talking about uh, talking about his past to his children so this is a very interesting device that lamp has tried to bring up where he is talking about his own recollections from his past about his uh, grandmother field and uh, uh, to whom uh, he and his sister uh, Uh, Mary uh, in the essay uh, called as Bridget Elia, so uh, who used to visit uh, and was to be awed by the giant paintings, the um, uh, tapestries in the uh, Hertfordshire. So, uh, so the thing is that he also brings up his uh, lost brother, whom he has lost at a very premature age. So. he relieves the image he relieves uh, the uh, character uh, character john lamb back in his essay who he thinks was he alive he would be someone very a man of state a brave and a handsome man 
So uh, this is very important. Uh, you see that throughout his essay, <clears throat> the entire essay is about his past. So where he is talking to his children. So it is a very, uh, it is a very, it is a unique blend of uh, fancy and imagination on one side, and on one side you have another, you on the other you have this facts and reality of John's uh, of uh, Lamb's own life, Charles Lamb's own life. So uh, from here uh, you can see that uh, Anne Simons, uh, the uh, lover who has rejected him, becomes Alice M. Then his dream children are his Alice and John. Uh, uh, then uh, John Lamb is also comes. You see, when I talk about Alice and John, you see Alice resembles Anne Simons, his lover, and John also, you can say, it brings back the memory of his brother John Lamb. He also brings his, uh, his um, memory of his sister Mary. So you see that in this essay, you will see that uh, his sister Mary has a very important place, not only in this essay, but in other essays as well. So Mary has been a constant companion of his boyhood in the temple and has given him a mother care. So they both were a constant source of comfort and deep understanding of the sympathy to each other. So they both grew up with the same uh, tragedy, with the same sorrows and with the same joy. So in a way, they shared the same emotions, same feelings. And as such, uh, Mary becomes the central, becomes the core of his essence. So this brother-sister relationship finds this words even in uh, Macquarie Ed in Hertfordshire, when he says that Bridget Elia has been my housekeeper for many a long year. I have obligations to Bridget. Extending beyond the period of memory, we house together old bachelor and maid in a set of double singles. So you see that the extent Mary was deeply personal of Lamb Perhaps because of the struggle they grew together, which, which would have brought them more closer. So in the dream children, you see that May, uh, how Mary centralizes the essay. So, so much so that uh, and you can see that Mary is one character who has that uh, extreme emotional, perhaps the most emotional space of Lamb's personal uh, life. So much so that he expresses the date of gratitude in a letter to Dorothy Wordsworth in June 14, 1805. I quote, she would share that Mary, while talking about his sister Mary, he says, she would share life and death, heaven and hell with me. She live but for me. I, but even in this upbraiding of myself, I am offending against her, for I know that she has cleaved to me for better for worse. So you can see that how this essays, be it Dream Children or the Christ Hospital, the South Sea House, he tries to bring out all those close relations, uh, all these acquaintances, and the purpose. It's supposed to be that he wants to keep them alive, not only to it, not only in his memory, but also uh, to the readers as well. In the next segment, I have dealt with the past of places. Now, in this past of places, we can see that he has never stopped from sharing his love for people. That's true. But also, even he has a very, he has happy memories of old places and scenes that thrilled him as a child. His childhood home, the temple, his school, the Christ Hospital, his workplace, this East India house, his vacation at Macquarie End or say Oxford or Blakesware, all have very uh, happy memory. All 
feature a very happy memory in Lamb's personal life. So, uh, the essay, The Old Benches of the Inner Temple, here in this essay, is, uh, brings up that this temple was the place of birth and infancy of Charles Lamb, where he and sister grew up together. <coughs> Sorry. So, this temple was a historical place in Old London. It was first the headquarters of the Knights Templar, later passed on to the two um, legal societies, the Inner and Middle Temple, uh, which obviously was a stronghold of law in the uh, city. So, uh, so this place has a very special place in the minds of Charles, uh, Charles Lamb. Because here, Charles and Mary played in the gardens, played in the halls, played in the corridors, and played in the fountains, which obviously has, or which obviously not only awed them in the, not only uh, was a matter of grandeur in their uh, childhood days, but also uh, a matter of, uh, I would use the word, a very uh, special treasured uh, memory. Uh, uh, spend with his sister uh, and also um, uh, the place itself. So when he says that, indeed, it is the most elegant spot in the metropolis. What a transition for a countryman visiting London for the first time. The passing from the crowded strand of Fleet Street by unexpected avenues into its magnificent ample squares, its classy green recesses. So, this the, the glamour of the place had so much enamored him that uh, in the same essay, you can see that even, uh, even changes made to the temple uh, becomes unbearable for Lamb. So, uh, he feels that, uh, that uh, any change, any uh, renovation to the place uh, seems to have offended him. So, when he says that they have lately um, Gothicized the entrance to the ten inner temple, hall and the library front to assimilate them, I suppose, to the body of the hall, which they do not at all resemble. What is becoming of the wind horse that stood over for a still arms? And who has removed those frescoes of the virtues which it and uh, italicized the end of the paper film. My first hint of allegory. Thy must account to me for these things, which I miss so great. So you see that, you see how that place had a deep impact on lab. So much so that a single change becomes unbearable for lab. Then again in the essay, The Christ Hospital 5 and 30 years ago, he, here he talks about the school days. So lab school days are well portrayed in this old and awful clusters of school Christ Hospital with its all regality and antiquity, its max, magnificence, its comfort, its tradition. And this blue coat boy lab is actually enamored by this school. So when he says that in his spacious school rooms and in the well-ordered, airy and lofty rooms where he sleeps in his stately dining hall, hung around with pictures by Vario, Lely and others, one of them surpassing in size and grandeur almost any other in the kingdom. So the very compounds and magnitude of the school, uh, thousand bearings, uh, the space it takes up, um, has all impressed a, uh, uh, impressed the remembrance of lab. It has accompanied with an elevation of mind that attends him throughout his life. So it is such a big, uh, it is so grandeur that uh, it cannot quickly pass away from his memories. So next day, uh, we have the uh, this essay, the South Sea House, which is obviously the first essay in the area. Um, when he talks about the workplace, his workplace, where he is supposed to have worked for five months. So here, Lamb has made every attempt to the 
to uh, to catch the bygone days. So uh, he even here, if you look down uh, that in this essay, uh, essay, you will find that he has tried to bring out the uh, how this South Sea House has the lasting impression. Means I mean that how the workplace, his workplace, has a lasting impression in his memories. So if you just read that this was once a house of trade, a center of busy interest. The throng of merchants was here. The quick pulse of gain, stately porticos, imposing staircases, offices, room, the still more sacred interiors of court and committee rooms, with venerable, venerable faces of beadles, doorkeepers, directors sitting in form of solemn days at long war meeting tables. The tarnished gilt leather covering supporting massy silver inkstands long since dry. Huge charts with subsequent discoveries have antiquated. Dusty maps of Mexico, deem as dreams and soundings of the Bay of Panama. Such is the sea house. At least such it was a 40 years ago when I knew it. A magnificent realm. What altercations may have been made in it since? I have had no opportunities of verifying. Time I take for granted has not freshened a thicker crust by the by this time stagnant sir. So you see that how land dwells in the past and gives it to scenes and the places that were dear to him. And in a way, he gives a kind of romantic atmosphere to the scenes and the places he has visited. Whether be it an old building or old garden or old library, old school, old bench, all have suffered the same sentiment of the impassioned recollection. In the next section, I've already told that he talks about the diverse topics. So when he talks about the diverse topics, that means he's not only encompassing the persons he has appointed or his close relations, not only the, um, I would say, the um, places he has visited, not only the scenes that he has gone, but also um, the uh, events, the incidents that has happened to him. So I have, he has in a way uh, interacting that uh, how his experiences from various events of his life found an obvious place in his essence. So the readers not only get a glimpse of his uh, personal life, um, but also uh, brood over uh, the incidents which actually occurred in Lamb's life. So, in uh, the essay uh, chapter on years, you will find that it is uh, how uh, Lab insinuates into the minds of the readers and tries to make it a bit more uh, interesting and, uh, uh, to the readers. So, so you see that the, the essay deals with uh, the uh, disease of uh, the year and Tommy and disease of the year with, in relation to music. That is the subject. Uh, which uh, illustrates the uh, how the integral role and the perception of music plays in the study of listening comprehension. And obviously this has a very significant uh, meaning towards uh, the um, um, society. But here you see that I've already mentioned that Lamb always tend to be very uh, confessional, just like his confidential. So here he is being a very, a very confessional to the readers that he, it is his inability to bear the sound of music. It is, he is not that he hates music, but it is that the vary of the terrible uh, notes of the deafening music. So it, it is so jarring to his ears that it simply put him off and then he just uh, find himself avoiding uh, going to places where it is played organically. So, uh, so for for instances, I would just uh, in one instant uh, instance he went to an orchestra and he was so much irritated by the uh, music that he was forced to rush out from that uh, grounding uh, place. So uh, there he confesses that I have no ear, mistake me not reader, nor imagine that I am by nature destitute of those exterior twin appendages. Hanging 
ornaments and architecturally speaking, handsome volutes to the human cap. Better my mother had never born me. I am, I think, I rather delicately than copiously provided with those can conduits. And I feel no disposition to envy the mule for his plate or the mole for her exactness. In those ingenious labyrinth inlets, those indispensable side intelligence. Well, therefore, I say that I have no ear. You will understand me to mean for music to say that this heart never melted and the concord of sweet sounds would be a foul self label. I ever think that sentimentally I am disposed to heart, but organically I am incapable of it. So, you see, it is not that he is, does not like music, it is only that he needs some soothing music to calm him down, rather not exciting to the tune of music. So, in the next, <clears throat> so in the next essay, he has talked about the praise of chimney uh, sweepers. Here he had talked about the children chimney sweepers, where he has tried to bring that how the children uh, worked uh, at the dangerous place of the, as uh, chimney sweepers, where they used to go deep down into the chimney to clean it and then come out with all uh, dirty and uh, and yet they are even uh, and, they, and, and the job is obviously dangerous. So uh, you see that how he blames the humor and pathos here, that on one side he's describing the dirty girls of children and the face of the children. On the other, he's also trying to bring out the pathos that uh, how these children might have been kidnapped, uh, as was the humor in those days, that they have been kidnapped from the upper class and uh, made hostages and um, uh, used them as apprentices to clean the chimney. So even here, he uh, tries to recollect one of the events uh, where uh, he fondly recollects his friend James White, who actually used to host an annual feast to the children, these chimney sweepers, where he was, where James White his, himself was a host and the waiter. So the luxury of feast was given annually to this children. So he quote that, he says that my pleasant friend James White was so impressed with the belief of metamorphosis like this frequently taking place that in some sort to reverse the wrongs of fortune in these poor changelings, he instituted an annual feast of chimney sweepers at which it was his pleasure to officiate as host and well. It was a solemn supper held in Smithfield. So you see, he you can see even here he is trying to bring up that event, which is in a way trying to brightening up the mood, try to lighten up, even though at the fact that children might have been it's a it's a pity that small children are working as chimney sweepers. <coughs> so next, uh, uh, now uh, obviously I come to the conclusion. Uh, so, after discussing the past of events, past of places, past of persons, now he Lamb has made every attempt to catch the charm of the bygone days. His love of past permeates all of his letters, essays, poems, and plays and stories. Such impassioned recollection obviously builds a sentimental attachment to well loved uh, scenes, persons, and books. And you can see, even though he confines himself to a past, there is a wistful glance towards his wrist, which will certainly reveal the sweet tempered, cool and angelic and calm personality. <clears throat> so in conclusion, you can see that I've tried to bring uh, five points. One is that you can see the self portrait. Self portrait means he was Oh, it was all about him and uh, his close relations, his scenes, his places. Then he also tried to develop a intimacy between reader and author. So he's uh, by uh, talking about the uh, things of commonality, uh, he's trying to establish a bond between the reader and the author, so that uh, an empathetic bond is created between two. He is also confessional. 
that even though uh, his confession to the extent that even though if he does not like anything, if he have a different, if he has a difference of opinion, he confesses them uh, straightforward to their parents. That he also uh, is uh, very personal. Uh, he reveals his persona mainly through the use of this incidence of I, me, you which obviously brings the reader into confidence, into uh, that, yes, someone is sharing very intimate details with us. And the fifth point is that he is not only imaginative, not only emotive, where he brings uh, like imagination in dream children, he becomes emotional when he talks about aunt, but he also uh, has a very intellectual appeal. Intellectual appeal, if you read about his uh, dissertation upon Rose Pay, you will see, or if, if you read uh, his essay, say, The Christ Hospital, you will see that he is uh, trying to bring up those events, those occasions uh, through which the reader can actually um, uh, have a space to uh, use their own creativity. And uh, this is the end of my lecture. So um, uh, I, now I, uh, I just say only one thing that there are uh, possible uh, questions uh, when you talk about lab, like uh, not only his personal lab, but also you will find uh, questions on um, uh, his humor and pathos, you will find questions on his use of fancy and imagination. Uh, you can all you will also find uh, the questions on uh, Charles Lamb's letters. So in case the degree uh, students are preparing for the exams, I will uh, just request you just glance through those topics as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, it was indeed a, an engrossing lecture, and I guess uh, uh, it will serve the purpose not only for the UG students, but also for the PG students, because I don't think that there is a single area which you have left uh, uh, regarding Charles Lamb as an essayist, right from, his, uh, right from the evolution of essays, then the difference between Montaigne and Bacon's essays to Lamb's essays, very nicely you referred to so many of his essays which are more very off quoted and you tried to bring out the humor pathos content into it and then how his essays are basically uh, reading into lamb the man himself so uh, thank you uh, very much uh, we'll uh, have uh, a few questions uh, uh, regarding this and uh, in the meantime i must say that uh, I am myself telling this that I don't think that there is a single topic that you have left. Anyone <laughs> who goes through this lecture can, e can easily write an answer on LAMP in any of the examinations at the UG or PG level. Uh, we'll look for the questions, ma'am, now. Yeah, sure. Mm. And the first question uh, is, uh, humor and pathos is one a prominent feature in Charles Lamb's essays. How these two feature when it comes to Lamb, the personal? Okay, uh, for this question, I will take uh, the example of, from his essay. Um, say, uh, uh, the praise uh, of the chimney sweeper itself. You see that in that essay, you will find that uh, Lamp is describing the uh, children, those who are uh, you know, working as chimney sweepers, as uh, someone uh, in a very humorous manner about the faces, the way they look after coming out from the chimney, by after cleaning up the chimney. Even in one uh, incident, he mentions that how one little boy uh, jumped into the uh, bed of a, a regal bed and then he slept there. So you can see that it, it brings a humorous, uh, um, uh, he, he brings in a very humorous manner. But at the same time, he also 
uh, brings the uh, you will feel pity towards the children because after all they are children and they are doing a dangerous job. So uh, the very fact that they are going deep uh, down to that chimney to clean it is a dangerous job. So which is really pity for such small children. And also in the same essay, he has he has also mentioned that there was also rumor that how pity is that that this children is supposed to have been kidnapped from their parents they have been forced to take up the job of the chimney sweep so here he is on one side is describing the chimney sweepers in a very humorous manner in a very ridiculous way um, on the other is uh, trying to build the pity for the children themselves okay the next question uh, can we have the next question uh, ma'am the next question is how lamb blends fact fiction at the same time in his essays so how is essays are a blend of fact and fiction both yeah okay for this i will take uh, the example of dream children okay so dream children is one such essay you will see that it encompasses everything be it lamb's personal life be it lamb's uh, human shadows and even his fact that fiction also comes in this essay dream children are reverie so if you just look at the very title you will see that there is the fiction is itself into the Uh, title itself right so here lamb is doing what he is having a fictional children he is uh, fantasizing he is imagining that he has uh, children out of um, the love okay uh, he has children from his lover annie simons who is alice m in the uh, essay so you see that is fictional that the dream children is fictional he is imagining that uh, he has two children alice and john he is married to ann simons who is alice m so that is his, his imagining that is his fictionalizing but he also talks about his past that is when he is the when the father is talking to the children the father is talking about the past so here lab becomes very factual here is talking about his real uh time uh, person his grandmother his uh, brother his sister even the places uh, he has visited uh, the vacations he has visited so you see that uh, this um, entire essay is uh, brings both uh, the factual lab uh, who actually talks about uh, his past his personal details at the same time he blends that uh, by using his own uh, imagination obviously which fictionalizes uh, both the um, uh, factual uh, events the factual uh, person the factual occasions of life uh, the next question is Hazlitt was also a popular essayist of Lamb's age. Then, on what terms Lamb stood unique? This is also a question from my side. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, how you do you how because because uh, when we when we when we read these now when we look at Lamb and Hazlitt, we feel that uh, both of them are uh, having their a class of their own. But then, uh, I would also like to know that how do you feel that Lamb is uh, Lamb stood unique? He's different to what has it was and he somehow shadows uh, has it okay see first of all let me tell you the similarities see both lamb and hazlit were personal okay they were personal in the essays they were subjective in the essays they talked about their likes they talked about their dislikes they talked about the preferences taste that was very common okay now when i talk about lamb uh, lamb was uh, if you compare hazlit with lamb Uh, i would just bring up that uh, image um, or say metaphor tiger and lamb because if you talk about lamb lamb was real lamb he was very gentle very meek and uh, on the other hand hazlit was very ferocious 
means he was he always had this tone uh, always high and he was very straight forward very outspoken so much so that his acquaintances were afraid of him they uh, they uh, they always were like i should not have any talk with him because he will be saying something very uh, weird so even so uh, this is one difference the nature of both okay secondly when you talk about in terms of essay you will find that both talk about personal okay but if you look at lamb's essays you will see that lamb is delineating his personal as they are means in a way that when we uh, read a story to children how we read it we just simply read them right we don't give our own thoughts we don't give our own opinions so lamb does the same he is simply delivering his own personal things his own person of what happened to him what he loved what he did just as it is okay but in case of hazlit he has given his personal but he was that of i would use the word egoist element were there in his essays or you can say idiosyncrasies were there in his essays when he actually he not only divulged his past but he also i would say he theorized his past he gave the, in lamb you will find why okay or what in hazlitt you will find why you will find it what so i think here lamb stood unique from hazlitt we'll have one last question ma'am for the day uh, and okay. the question is lamb's essays have personal tone what about his other works are they pers too personal oh yes uh, see uh, uh, obviously his essays are personal but if you look at his other works uh, and other works i will just talk about i'm fond of his letters okay so uh, if you just look at his letters so i think they were very personal okay when even there he has talked about the people he loved the places he has visited uh, the uh, incidents that has left lasting impact uh, on his uh, life for example mm, uh, i have already said that his sister mary as cousin cousin bridget in his essays right so you see this mary this his relationship with mary he has also shared this with his um, in a letter to dorothy watson okay where he is actually showing a gratitude towards mary even uh, when he was writing to paul rich uh, uh, after the death of his aunt he uh, he mentioned that it is his life and loss and so much so that he penned down a funeral poem for his aunt again if you look at uh, another letter i can remember he wrote to wordsworth it was uh, while uh, uh, just before he started working on his uh, essay uh, he wrote to wordsworth that he actually want to bring up his own opinion um uh, such a own past own personal details uh, out of some of his own writing okay so you see even uh, so i think that he has been a person throughout his essays and i think one more work i'll say uh, old familiar faces yes old familiar faces where he in fact he brings up all the relations all the people uh, he was very close to so i think yes lamp was personal in other works also most of the works thank you so much ma'am uh, this question answer session was equally interesting because for each question you quoted one or two of his essays so that <laughs> that speaks volumes about uh, the kind of information that you have in store regarding lamb as an essay uh, and uh, we wish to have uh, many such lectures further uh, on behalf of the organizers the department of english kkm college jammu and english literature briefs i'll once again thank you for being with us for sparing uh, your valuable time and 
speaking uh, your heart out on a topic like this which will definitely be of great help i am reiterating not only for the students for but for also <laughs> teachers like us thank you so much thank you so uh, this was uh, today's session uh, today's lecture we had for you uh, in this series of the ongoing online lecture series uh, tomorrow we will conclude this uh, online lecture series uh, with uh, one of uh, with a session where we will have one lecture by uh, the convener of this lecture series the organizer of this lecture series dr anand sundar pauli on uh, jen austen's classic pride and prejudice as a social novel i'll request all of you to join uh, for that uh, last and the final session and uh, with the amount of uh, expertise that uh, dr polly has uh, on victorian fiction and on jane austen in particular i i look forward to that session as uh, to be a, a wonderful one and to be a, a session which will definitely bring to us various facets of uh, jane austen's novelistic uh, creativity in uh, the novel pride and prejudice so with a just slight with a minute reminder that we meet tomorrow again at 11 for the last lecture of this series uh, that is being organized by the department of english kkm college jammu and english literature briefs uh, it is me a priya ranjan signing off for today thank you very much thank you <laughs>